I wouldn't buy this for a dollar. The following is an in-depth story analysis. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before watching this review. In case you need it clarified, I'm referring to the first film when I say thrilling, and I'm referring to this one when I say boring. I'm going to be as interesting as I can with this review, but one of the only things I remembered about this movie walking out of the theater was how unmemorable I thought it was. I just watched it again, and it's not sticking with me real well right now. The RoboCop remake is a prime example of an obligatory remake. There's no good reason for this thing to exist, and I'm not sure how many people will even remember that it does in the future. It faded into obscurity pretty quickly, and rightly so. It's almost worse than bad, it's mediocre. It's not offensively awful, it's not a slap in the face to the original, really, and it's competent enough to be infuriating, because it feels like it almost goes out of its way to be so dull. It has a star-studded cast, I'm convinced, just to give it credibility. Some of my favorite actors are here, and they all look zoned out, or clueless, or just happy for the paycheck. Really, look at any scene with Michael Keaton's villainous corporate tycoon, Raymond Sellers, and the look on his face seems to say, why are we remaking Robocop again? We got Keaton, who never gets to do his signature, I'm done with this crap, angry Keaton thing. And he's the main bad guy. We got Gary Oldman, who brings as much conflicted energy to Dr. Norton as he can, a man whose principles are constantly being compromised in the name of progress and the bottom line, but I can't decide how he really feels about anything he's doing until the very end. We've got Sam Jackson, who does his typical wild-eyed, speechifying Sam Jackson thing as a conservative TV propagandist in scenes that provide exposition from an unreliable voice and confuse the tone of the movie. And while he's doing what he's paid to do, he looks a little confused about the material. And we've got Jackie Earl Haley playing a punk military expert who has an awkward motivation, and he's doing his best, but he's kind of wasted here. Although it's interesting hearing him use something closer to his regular voice, because every other movie and show I've seen him in, he's doing a low growl or an old man voice. And Alex Murphy, the starring role, is played by Joel Kinnaman, which is solid casting, but he's channeling Peter Weller too much for such a bland, uninteresting version of the character. He doesn't carry the movie, and his performance comes off stiff and phoned in through much of it. I don't think it's Kinnaman's fault, though. I liked him a lot in House of Cards, and I guess he's fine as Rick Flagg in Suicide Squad. He doesn't always wind up in the best projects, but I don't know if anyone could have carried this movie with such uninspired material. It screams, well, here's a franchise that hasn't been rebooted yet, and while it sort of tries to take a different tack instead of making exactly the same movie Verhoeven did, it never makes a good argument for trying to update the material. The original holds up wonderfully, and is still as relevant now as it was in 1987, as a bleak satire about urban upheaval, public and private authority, and man's over-reliance on technology. Sure, it doesn't look like today's world with today's technology, but it's a heightened reality that wasn't exactly what the world looked like in the 80s either, set in either an alternate present or an ambiguous future. The world still experiences the same problems, and people have the same concerns, arguably more so now. We see it in so much of our science fiction today, and even just mainstream dramas, because we're basically living in a cyberpunk future now. And a lot of sci-fi writers from decades ago would, I'm sure, look at the world today and say we're rapidly approaching the dystopia a lot of them predicted. We worry that we can't think for ourselves anymore, relying too much on machines. We worry that automation is taking over, that there won't be a place for some of us in the future, and that machines are regulating our lives from the way we shop to the way our government protects us. The fear of what drone warfare means has been a major common theme in popular media for a decade now, and we worry that because of all that, we're becoming less than human. The original Robocop remains a great study of those fears and of the human condition. There's just no reason to do that movie again. And this movie both does and doesn't do that movie again. I think the original film is brilliant, and my knee-jerk reaction to this was that it's a cash grab and a waste of time. I'm always willing to be proven wrong, but I didn't have high hopes for this. Robocop isn't a typical superhero movie. I still maintain that it is a superhero movie, but it did, I've been told, degenerate into a typical superhero franchise, with movies that were action schlock rather than the thought-provoking 
material Verhoeven gave us. I haven't reviewed those yet. Like I mentioned in the Trial of the Incredible Hulk review, I usually do franchises in the order the movies come out. And likewise, I'd usually do a whole franchise before I tackle the reboot. But I'm doing the 12 Days of Rewind by request, and this one was picked by Gui D, who also has never seen the sequels. Hey, we have a lot in common, me and him. We both like Robocop, and we both chose to sit through a sterile, forgettable remake. Seriously, I'm going to have to get into what meat is here soon, or I'm not going to remember anything that happens. I don't need the exact same movie. I have that. If this must exist, and it doesn't want to be in the same universe as the original, like go way in the future, like the current plan Soft Reboot is supposedly doing, I want it to try something new. It would be nice to see it take some bold chances like the original, but I also don't need it to be good or entertaining in the same way. I didn't go into this saying, it had better be a poignant satire or it gets an F. Or I guess, on my scale, a zero. The problem is, this is another one of those make-everyone-happy kinds of movies. It feels very made by committee. It needs these disparate elements to scientifically guarantee interest from these demographics, and now throw all those together and try to make something coherent. So it's both a different kind of RoboCop and the same kind of RoboCop. It's not a satire, but sometimes it seems to think it's a satire. I just want the movie to be clear in its intentions and deliver on its promises. This movie promises to be authentically the RoboCop you remember, and also something brand spanking new. In other words, it has no real vision, and it's scared to tick off diehards or confuse newcomers. That always goes well. It gives me Star Trek 09 flashbacks, except that was entertaining. This movie comes from the same school of thought as the Ghostbusters reboot a couple years later. Hollywood executives have this weird idea that origins are inherently interesting. Like, as franchise starters, it's not about making a good, solid movie that sequels can be made of if it's successful. It's about seeing how the hero gets started before the ball really gets going. As I've always said, the beginning of a hero's journey is sometimes great if it's a story that should be told. Batman Begins, X-Men First Class... Black Panther, but if you don't have a story to tell, start after the tragic accident and give us the Cliffs notes. Rebooting a character with an origin movie is often even more glaring because it didn't feel like an origin in the first place. Yes, in the original Ghostbusters, we don't come in after the Ghostbusters set up shop. It's technically an origin. But I don't think of it like that when I'm watching it. It's just a movie about some guys who decide to start a paranormal extermination service. It's not an excuse to waste time for a whole movie until we get to the actual good stuff. That and Robocop are both good case in points because they only have one great movie each. Apparently. Again, I've not seen any more of the Robocop films. Robocop wasn't an origin story for a serialized character. It was a story about a guy who gets most of his body blown up, gets turned into a machine, and struggles to find his humanity again. The remake feels like a superhero origin story. Get him in the robot suit, spend the whole movie on the premise, establish a status quo at the end, oh, he's back with his family, and he's working as a cop again, and hope the movie makes enough money to warrant another one. And the trouble with not making a piece that stands on its own is that it's easily dismissed, especially if this is all we get. Movies shouldn't be pilots to TV shows. They're movies. Very few pilots are remembered all on their own, but a good movie can last forever, whether it has good sequels, bad sequels, or none at all. The way it gets to the major beats is a little different, but it's pretty much the same movie, except without the style, the compelling performance, the subtle character study, or the fun of the original. At its best, this is a dime a dozen 21st century science fiction film, warning us about all the same stuff most recent sci-fi does. Freedom is more important than protection, be careful not to let convenience rob you of your humanity. Anyone who just saw this movie and never saw the original would probably wonder what the fuss was about, especially anyone who has seen another science fiction film since the year 2000. We've all seen this movie, and it wasn't Robocop. There is interesting stuff here, but I don't think what's interesting is in the action of the movie so much as stuff people talk about, and the premise is overly complicated in the movie's attempt to set itself apart. So like the original, this movie is about a cop named Alex Murphy, whose body is horribly decimated by gangsters. A company called Omnicorp repurposes his remains in a humanoid robot, hoping to use him as a more efficient law enforcement machine to replace human cops. Murphy does what he's told at first, but eventually solves his own murder and goes off on his own, refusing to be the property of a greedy corporation or work with corrupt cops. We're supposed to question how much of his humanity remains intact. 
if the machine is in charge, or if it's the man, and he longs to return to his family. By the end, he answers that question by breaking past his programming and killing the CEO of the evil corporation, who he shouldn't be able to take out because of safeguards in his circuitry, and without question, the real Alex Murphy is still in there. The skeleton of the same story is there, but it's focused on different things. This movie isn't about a society that's already lost itself like the original, or at least not much more than ours arguably has already. It's hard not to feel a little cynical reviewing this movie. It's trying a more realistic and speculative science fiction approach. This movie takes place in a specific year, 2028, and I think at one time it was going to be called Robocop 2028, and it imagines what the political and corporate climate might be like around the ethics of artificial intelligence and drone warfare. There's a public argument constantly looming about whether drones are better than people in law enforcement and war because they're more efficient and they don't hesitate, or whether the human factor is necessary because robots are cold and don't have compassion or empathy. And, you know, we don't want a Terminator situation. The movie tries to create a constant struggle within Robocop, a war between the mechanical and the human, which is made more literal than in the original. Instead of an existential conflict, this war is waged on computer monitors, in circuitry, and in chemistry. The human body and the robotics are incompatible. We see this idea illustrated when we're introduced to Norton at the beginning, who gives a man missing both his hands artificial robotic implants. It's a really on-the-nose way to drive this point home, and I rolled my eyes. He can play the guitar perfectly, which I don't really buy on his first try, given that he has no nerve endings and can't feel the pressure of the strings, but after a while, his emotions get in the way. Any strong emotion messes with the link between the brain and the machine, establishing the inherent flaw in the technology and foreshadowing what will happen with Murphy later. This encapsulates the theme of the film, the ways in which humanity and technology are opposites. It's a good idea to explore, but in oversimplified execution that hopes the audience is stupid. When it comes to either augmenting the brain itself with artificial implants or trying to give robots emotions, yes, the technologies might not be compatible, but we already know enough right now to connect artificial limbs to the brain and use the brain's synapses to manipulate them. Getting emotional wouldn't affect that, at least not in the way it does here, where the hand just freaks out and won't work right, like signals are being sent through to it it doesn't understand. Aren't motor control and emotion governed by different parts of the brain? In this movie, Omnicorp wants to create something that is both all man and all machine, and the message is that that isn't possible. In the first movie, Omnicorp doesn't want a man, it wants a machine. Initially, it's the opposite here. Eventually, that becomes a last resort for Sellers, the CEO, but at first, he wants a man that can do everything a machine can because popular opinion is against him. 70% of the American public don't want drones protecting the streets because they want the human factor, cops that make them feel safe because they care. And we are apparently the only country in the world that isn't using drones on the streets, which I'm also not sure I totally buy. But Norton, his head scientist, finds that it's impossible for a man, even with his brain connected to and taking orders from a machine, to have the same response time and efficiency as the drones, because he hesitates, because he cares about people. That war for dominance idea is interesting, that instead of clawing his way up in a haunting nightmare scenario where he's turned into a machine, Murphy would have to try to work with the robotics in an attempt to save his life. The first thing is more interesting to me, but I do like the more positive spin of a scientist trying to save Murphy's life, and the conflict is about whether he can survive in this new body, intended to allow him to be himself, and actually be who he is. How important is the body you're born with to holding on to your identity? How important is touch? And if his mind is augmented with a computer, downloading crime information to his mind, taking over in combat situations, and telling him what to do in any given scenario, does he become something else entirely? Does he have to sacrifice too much of himself to the point that it's not worth it? If the body only works without much emotion, is he effectively already dead because he's forced to become the robot? The trouble is, none of those ideas inherent in this concept are really explored, and I have a hard time getting on board with that initial premise, that the machine starts breaking down if Murphy is too human. That's theme-driving story, and it watches a little hokey and cheesy. It does make sense that the human factor is a problem if Sellers needs Robocop to be as fast and efficient as an ED-209 robot. 
But I'm also not buying the social politics of this either. It feels like I've got to be missing something, but I cannot figure out what it is. The public prefers human cops over robots already, and you're trying to convince them to be okay with a compromise. So why exactly does a robocop have to be perfect? It can already do a lot more than your average cop. Murphy can investigate cases and locate and apprehend suspects in a fraction of the time it takes a human officer. Sellers tells Norton he can't have an inferior product, so Norton starts taking away more and more of Murphy's control until the computer is calling all the shots. But he's not that much slower in combat scenarios, and if what people want is a cop that's thoughtful and careful and doesn't make cold utilitarian decisions about who lives or who dies, don't they, by definition, want a cop that hesitates? So what Sellers is giving them is something that looks like a man but isn't. And how long would it take before people realized that and turned on him? I get that he thinks having Robocop on the streets will get the Dreyfus Act overturned, the legislation that outlaws war drones used domestically, and so he only needs people on board with Robocop for like a few days? But then why does it matter how fast it is? It seems like all he really needs is a robot with a person inside, which is what he has. But I also don't see why so much of the public and Congress changed their minds about the Dreyfus Act based solely on that. The law is overturned by a two-thirds majority. Sellers can skirt around the law to make Robocop because he seems more like a man than a machine. One of the women at Omnicorp questions the legality of this at one point, saying, you've circumvented the law by creating a machine that thinks it's a man. Which is not at all what happened, but I'll get to that in a second. Sellers then says, it's a machine that thinks it's Alex Murphy. In my book, that's legal. Okay, so he can keep making Robocops, but he has other products he wants to sell, so I get why he still wants the law repealed. But why would people getting the human cop they want mean they'd suddenly be okay with artificial ones? And all this is just a contrivance anyway, to make Sellers think he has to make Murphy less human. The impetus for the drama falls apart under scrutiny. Even worse than not understanding why Sellers and Norton have to be so nefarious to get what they want is not believing the hero's plight and what people keep saying about him. The movie constantly pretends like it's doing what I said would be interesting, seeing a man who starts out fully human, even as Robocop, slowly get eaten by the machine. There are several stages of Omnicorp's control of Alex. First, he has full control, and they just give him orders like a soldier. Then, Norton messes with his brain and makes it so that in combat situations, the computer takes over, but Alex is led to believe he's still calling the shots. And finally, Norton just drops his dopamine levels down to 2%, so that the machine is doing almost everything, and he's completely robotic. That's when he starts acting like Peter Weller's Robocop, ignoring his family and tasing suspects coldly and without warning. But at no point do I wonder where the man begins and the machine ends. Again, it's not a problem because it's not like the original. It's a problem because characters are talking about Alex like he's not a person anymore when he clearly is. And because nothing about this is interesting. I guess it's trying to do something similar to the original, when Alex somehow raises his own dopamine levels again and starts solving his own murder, taking down the gangster who killed him, and exposing the crooked cops who were involved, then at the end, when he shoots Sellers against his programming. Like, look, humanity still prevails. You can't artificially suppress the human soul, I guess. I cringed a little when one of the nameless, personalityless Omnicorp employees actually comes out and says that. But there are a lot of problems with it. A, I never feel like Alex is fighting the machine. He's always fighting Norton and Sellers. It always feels like at any point, Norton could reverse everything he's done to Alex, and he'll go right back to normal. I'm not sure why he's still stoic Robocop at the end, except that's how we know him and love him from the original. So he has to end the movie with what we think of as Robocop status quo, if there is such a thing. That's what origin reboots are for, you see. Get you to the familiar, even if it doesn't make much sense how we get there. It feels like Norton just has to undo the voodoo he did on Alex's brain and fix the dopamine levels, and you have a guy with no conflict about his identity or his humanity whatsoever. When Maddox is testing him with a war game, somebody says he's a robot who thinks he's a man, because Alex thinks he's in control whenever the visor goes down and the computer is actually doing all the work. But that's not what's communicated by what we're actually seeing. He's not gradually losing himself. Every time he's more robotic, it's because of a specific thing that's done to him, and it happens immediately. It also always feels totally reversible. 
there's no existential ambiguity at all. B, when he loses control, Alex starts to reassert it again, almost immediately. He seems like a regular person for a long time, and then his personality is suppressed artificially, because he freaks out when he gets images of his family in his own murder during the first crime info download dump, and then very soon after, Alex is able to do what he wants to, through the machine's programming. Oh, and side note, Maybe right before Murphy is supposed to make a public appearance isn't the right time to test a system where he gets tons of crime information in his head that might cause a nervous breakdown and a system shutdown. Why are we doing that now? Pick any other time. Oh, to force the drama and suddenly make him all cold and emotionless like, you know, Robocop. He's acting like a soulless robot now, but Murphy is almost immediately regaining control, just more subtly. He's supposed to investigate murders, so he works on his own. His personality was still very present not that long earlier, so it's no surprise when this starts happening. I assumed Norton just left a little too much dopamine in his system. But oh, he's raising it. Isn't that a miracle? There's no tension with any of this. If he had been secretly fighting inside the robot the whole time and then this happened, it might be interesting, but this movie started in a different place, and it's like it wasn't sure where to go from there, so it just gave up and became the first movie again. C. It's not an exciting or endearing moment when Murphy breaks his programming to shoot Sellers, because we already had the somehow the human soul is breaking through moment with the manually raised dopamine. The red asset thing is also introduced way too late. It's like the prime directives in the original movie, but there's only one, and we don't even hear about it until the third act. Some people are red assets, and Robocop can't shoot them. Sellers is one of those, but Robocop can shoot him at the end, because Alex is more in control there. And he's already been more in control for a while now. I don't know why I'm supposed to be shocked by this, or why it means anything. It's just how the first movie ended, so I guess we have to do that here too. Except here, he ambiguously violates his programming instead of the more interesting way the original does it, where he can't do that and he's allowed to kill Dick because the CEO fires him. So Directive 4, the hidden directive that prevents him from harming an OCP employee, no longer applies. That was compelling because despite the limitations of his programming, we can still tell there's a man in there. Oh, and it happens on a helicopter pad this time. One that looks and is shot a lot like the one we see earlier in the first movie. It's still banking on nostalgia, even though the backdrop for this particular scene has changed. And just to add insult to injury, we better throw in the catchphrase, but in a different context, so it seems clever, and not just thrown in there for nostalgia, even though that's exactly why it's there. Seller says, I'm the only one with the technology to keep you alive. And Robocop says, dead or alive, you're coming with me. What? How does that response even follow? We also had to get I'd buy that for a dollar in there with Maddox, or I guess that's I wouldn't buy that for a dollar, but that's at least more subtle and something I can see someone just saying. Maybe it's a figure of speech in 2028, or maybe that terrible TV show from the original movie exists in this universe and he's quoting that. Kind of nice that's just snuck in and we don't make a big deal out of it, but Dead or Alive is used in the big climax scene and it's as forced in as it gets. It doesn't help that I just don't care about Murphy in the first place. He doesn't have any charisma or charm before he gets hurt, and he has his whole personality intact as he becomes Robocop, but there's nothing unique or compelling about it. It's ironic that I cared so much more about a guy who seemed like a complete robot in the first movie, but I can't care less about an emotional, crying, lonely man who I see trussed up without his robot body, just a head, a heart, and a hand left which he loses later, I guess, to symbolize his total reliance on the machinery, or to signify his having to fight so much harder to retain his humanity as Omnicorp sort of, kind of, takes it from him to serve their bottom line, even though they don't really need to do this at all. I like that it's haunting in a different way. Seeing the physical loss of almost his entire body here is pretty unnerving, and it's a good effect, but the guy it's happened to is a slab of wood I've barely spent any time with, and the film presents him like a hero I'm already super invested in. It's all plot at the beginning. No time to get to know anyone, just thrust into the conflict, but forgetting to draw characters as we go. Alex's partner gets hurt, he wants to get even, he goes up against a drug lord, there's corruption in the police department and a conspiracy against him, and it feels rushed in a way it doesn't in the original, even though that's done pretty fast too. His partner here is hardly in the film, and I keep forgetting about that guy, so I don't have a read on him, except he's supposed to be a good cop who cares about his friend. Murphy's wife is a non-character who's upset all the time because her husband got hurt and then became a robot, and now she's not allowed to see him anymore. 
And yeah, I'd be upset too, but that's all we get. She and her husband get along. She seems to be a good mother. It's all surface. No chemistry, no details, just a married couple with a kid and a tragedy. Which is about all we get in the first movie too, but that felt efficient and there was a purpose to it. A lot of characters are one-dimensional in the original because that's a satire. They've lost their humanity because of the perverse society they live in, and Robocop is supposed to be more human by comparison. We're also distanced from most everyone there because we're supposed to see the world from Robocop's cold eyes, and he's walled off from the people he cares about. This movie is presented more like a traditional narrative and in a less heightened reality, so there is no excuse. It's like nobody's drawn because it's Robocop. Robocop's not supposed to have well-developed characters. Another problem is that so much of the focus is on the corporate politics and the characters involved in that from the very beginning. If Robocop is supposed to be in the background and not a standard superhero kind of protagonist, we need someone else to follow, like Officer Lewis in the original. I thought our eyes in might be the scientist, Norton, who's the only character in the movie who really gets an arc. It's not really Murphy's story, even though it pretends to be. Most of the action happens to him. And again, he's a bodiless man constantly being controlled, rather than a man we watch slowly come back from the dead and find himself within the machine. It's like if the main character of Avengers was Hawkeye, who's mind-controlled until the third act. And Murphy's triumphant reassertion of control feels like a thing that's just supposed to happen at that point in the script, instead of something naturally arrived at. Norton is odd, because while I can see all the steps of his betrayal and redemption arc by the end, I'm not sure at all what to make of him until he chooses to go against Sellers and help Robocop in the third act. Norton keeps going against his ethics, starting out as a scientist whose work, he says, is a means to its own end, truly wanting to help Alex and not interested at all in Omnicorp's corporate agenda. But then he acquiesces more and more to Sellers' whims as he fears Sellers will ruin his reputation making more and more compromises to Alex's freedom until he's being used as a slave. I'm never confident that the movie even remembers who Norton started off as. There's not a clear descent into amorality, so much as Norton just doing bad things, and my questioning how moral he was in the first place. The problem is that everyone keeps their own counsel in this movie. Nobody talks about anything, and people rarely act like I would expect real people to act, so I get suspicious of anything that looks like a character learning or growing. I thought maybe Norton was just corrupted right away, after he monkeys with Alex's brain that first time, and then that's it. But nope, he's supposed to feel increasingly guilty about what he's doing, until he just can't be pushed any further. And that line is, of course, in Killing Robocop. When Sellers asks for that, Norton pretends to go along with it in exchange for funding, and then goes against him to help Robocop escape. I'm not saying Norton needed to constantly explain his motivations or his reservations, and I do think more of that could be conveyed with more coverage. Just linger with him after he makes a horrible choice and show the pain on his face. For such a slow and padded movie, it's odd how infrequently we just stop on a reaction or an expression. In general, it's a movie that's not sure what to do with its visuals. The action is always stale and unengaging. Most of it is training stuff, so it's not especially inventive anyway, but I find myself tuning out during ostensibly tense and important scenes, like Robocop going after the guy who murdered him. That guy is another unremarkable character who isn't just underdeveloped, he's no fun at all. But it's also shot boring. It's dark, it plays with lights going out a little, but I know what's going to happen and I'm just waiting for it to end. And there are a lot of weird directing choices. We're introduced to nearly every major character from behind. We see the back of Alex's head and follow him down a hall while he's talking before we finally see his face in an office. Like, it's a big reveal. You'll never believe Robocop's played by this guy, and he's not even a big actor. Keaton is introduced that way too, but at least it's Keaton. I don't know why the movie keeps doing this. I'm also a little bewildered by Jackie Earl Haley's character Maddox. Interestingly named, because he sees Murphy as a robot and nothing more, just like Bruce Maddox in the Star Trek The Next Generation episode The Measure of a Man thinks the same thing about Data. I think that's just a coincidence, though. This Maddox is spelled with T's instead of D's, and the similarities end there. It's just something I noticed and I thought I'd share. Maddox is a military cybernetics expert who thinks, like talking propaganda head Pat Novak, that robots are better for law enforcement because they're better at everything and people don't have to put their own lives at risk. Never mind that they might save a little girl from getting hit in the crossfire. If you're not as fast as his drones, you present a greater threat. He doesn't like Murphy from the beginning because he sees him as a threat to the kind of warfare he believes in. 
Which is odd on its own, since the whole point of Robocop is to somehow convince the government to repeal the Dreyfus Act. So if this works, he's more likely to get what he wants. But maybe nobody's explained any of this to him. Maddox is the only person in the movie who treats Robocop like he's not a person at all, calling him Tin Man and playing If I Only Had a Heart from The Wizard of Oz during the first test. Again, I'm just not buying what the movie is selling. Murphy is clearly still a man, just inside a machine, whose own control is bypassed by a computer during combat. This guy's opinion is based on nothing. It's just clearly, factually wrong. I guess he thinks a complete brain and a heart isn't enough to consider a person a person. Does he think you stop being a person if most of your physical body is gone? But that's just stupid though, right? Or is he just trying to intimidate Robocop, but he doesn't actually think that? He just wants Murphy to fail, so he's condescending. I really don't know. The movie is terrible at communicating characters' intent. I get the impression, though, that it's supposed to be his real opinion, and that there's supposed to be a thought-provoking argument here about when a person stops being a person, but it doesn't work at all. And unless Maddox is just trying to get under Murphy's proverbial skin, it's odd to have a character who doesn't want Murphy in the field because he's too human to have robot-level response times, but thinks he's not human at all. His whole problem with Robocop is that they used a person who's too compassionate to be effective, but Maddox doesn't think he's a person. I don't get it. The if I only had a heart choice is also strange, because Murphy does have a heart. It's one of the only organs he has left. There's also a scene where Murphy is about to see his family for the first time since the accident, and he says, if I had a pulse, it would be racing. But doesn't he have a pulse? He still has his heart. Why can't the movie remember the basics of its own story? I thought keeping his heart, besides pumping oxygen to the brain, was like a symbolic thing. Like the two things you need for sure to be who you are. Are your memories and self-awareness, which come from the brain, and your empathy, which doesn't literally come from the heart, but is often represented by the heart. The movie makes a major thematic point of that, and then frequently can't remember the heart is in there. That would be like if Tony Stark sometimes had an arc reactor and sometimes didn't, because it forgot its own premise and the thematic crux of the narrative. The remake isn't a straight-up satire, but it bookends with satirical scenes to appease fans of the original, I think. While most of the movie is presented as a straightforward narrative in a future that could be our future, not an almost dystopia, Sam Jackson's Pat Novak, which sounds like a game show host name, is a holdover from that kind of storytelling, which makes the whole experience awkward, because you think you're getting one thing, and then it immediately turns out to be something else. This is the movie's version of the news broadcasts of the original Robocop, which give us a sense of the larger political climate and draw the curtain back on that exaggerated and absurd near-anarchistic world. That worked because the whole movie was a satire, and because we needed that window into the world at large. But the focus is so much on the Omnicorp employees and the politics at large here, it only serves as exposition, most of which we get some other way, and which we can't always trust because of the source and to confuse the movie's tone. Novak keeps saying things the movie wants us to think are scary. He's clearly saying the opposite of everything the movie wants to say. It's like spelling out the message of the film through reverse psychology. Novak gives us the counter-message, which is supposed to look insane and wrong, like 1984 doublespeak, and maybe also mask that it is a movie that can't give its audience enough credit not to spoon-feed the moral. He's pro-big business, doesn't like the government is keeping drones off the street, and thinks, like Nick Fury and Winter Soldier, played by the same actor, that safety is more important than freedom. Or he's naive enough to think there's no danger of people losing their rights with robots making the hard calls on the streets. Or he's being paid to spin a narrative on corporate media. This is clearly a Fox News analog. There's a scene where he brings both Sellers and Dreyfus, the senator who spearheaded the legislation against drone cops, onto his show. Sellers in person and Dreyfus in a hologram. And of course, Novak turns Dreyfus off before he has a chance to say anything of substance. The movie tries to satirize the side it disagrees with, but it comes off heavy-handed because the rest of the movie isn't this kind of movie. And like so much in this movie, it's overly simplified and it creates an argument that's not very interesting because it says one side is clearly right from the get-go and the other side is corrupted. So I'm not weighing the pros and cons between human and robot law enforcement. It makes me say, okay, the movie has already told me what side I'm supposed to champion. What's weird is, if you ignore all that stuff and just look at the narrative, it actually kind of ends somewhere in the middle. 
Robocop continues on, but he's as much Murphy as he is a robot. He's found a balance. The robot improves his technical and physical ability, and his humanity tempers the robot. That wouldn't suggest human good, robot bad, but that one can't or shouldn't be changed into the other. But then you get this awkward ending, with Novak telling the country to stop whining about mechanical soldiers and cops, and that we're the greatest nation on earth, and that's what we're left with. An extreme conservative saying people might call us imperialists, but we're America. Um, so there. Like, we deserve to be imperialists or something. It's out of place, and it's not really what the whole movie has been about. And this guy likes Robocop and calls Murphy a hero, so I don't get what his problem is. Why doesn't he like the compromise of machines with a human heart, which has been proven possible and which allows paraplegic officers and cops with other physical ailments to continue serving? They just can't do everything a robot can. And it's not like he's out there saying, Robocop's a step in the right direction, but we better get to a place where a human cop never hesitates about anything. Novak is also right that Norton should be put in prison for screwing around with Murphy's brain and controlling him. The huge corporation called Omnicorp, which you treated as totally benevolent, turned out to only be interested in their own bottom line. What a surprise. But his takeaway, and again, maybe this is just supposed to be the corporate news spin, is that Robocop proves that robots are better in the field. The movie trying to say the opposite with this ridiculous lunatic on TV, while the actual events of the film suggest the answer lies somewhere in the middle. It's as if this movie had four different writers. Oh wait, it did. This has been a strange experience for me. I have a different attitude about this movie than I did at the start of this review. After watching this again, my opinion was the same as walking out of the theater. It's fine, but it's unremarkable, and it just doesn't justify its existence. But spending some more time with the material, I actually think it's worse than that. It's all falling apart for me the more I think and write about it. I don't like or care about any of the characters. The moral arguments are paper-thin and not as interesting as the movie wants me to think they are. And I know by the basic premise and character motivations that give us Robocop. The bad guy doesn't really need to take away Murphy's free will to get what he wants, and Murphy's humanity isn't actually in question, really. There's an attempt made here initially to bring a different flavor and approach to the material, which I appreciate, but it's not smart about it. I'm left with a million questions that I won't even care to have the answers to by tomorrow because the film is so stiff and dull and I probably won't remember much of it. The most memorable thing about it will be the scar I made in my head, scratching it so much. I sat down to write this fully expecting to arrive at a 2, but I just can't go that high. I'm giving the Robocop remake a 1.5 out of 4. And that's another one down. Thanks for listening, everybody, and tune in again tomorrow to find out what the next movie is that I have been gifted to review for the 12 days of Superhero Rewind. If you'd like to support the channel, go to patreon.com slash geekvolution for just $2 a month. You can get regular episodes of Superhero Rewind three days early, as well as access to Geek Geekvolution After Dark, our uncensored talk show that we post twice a month. At the $10 tier, you can become a Patreon producer, and I'd like to thank all of our producers right now, including Dylan Muschiello, Nick Manna, Eamon Singleton, Cletus Winslow, Remy LeBlanc, Derek Jacob, The Day Ghost, Michael Gulick, Magpie's Nest Productions, Kareem Roberts, Lot 10 Underground, Michael Mark Micheletti, Carl Maxey, Dimitri J, John Johnson, Jacob Schneider, Nathan Hanford, Aram Zangana, Joey Crouch, Sartaj Govind Singh, Ethan Guidi, Caleb, Malik Myers, Lone Wolf Jedi of Gotham, Chewbacca's Lover, David Crabtree, Simeon Scott, Justin Hayes, Marie Flowers, Jacob Whitfield, Ian McKee, and Jeffrey Patron. And I also want to mention that at the $50 tier, you can request a movie to be reviewed on Superhero Rewind or Science Fiction Rewind. Join me again tomorrow, and I can't wait to show you what is coming next. I'm Captain Logan, and thanks again so much for listening. <laughs>